Hey everyone, thank you again for your support of Entrepreneurial Appetite's Black Book Discussion. Beginning this season, we are inviting our listeners to support the show through our Patreon website. The founding 55 patrons will get live access to our monthly discussions for only $5 a month. Your support will help us hire an intern or freelancer to help with the production of the show. Of course, you can also support us by giving us five stars, leaving a positive comment, or sharing the show with a few friends. Thank you for your continued support. Um. Yeah, we were having a, a, a great conversation about, about policy and black folk getting access to the outdoors. We, we have, I think up here, a group of people who um, are, are making history. And I, I wanna have the opportunity to bring somebody else on who could talk about black folks experience in the outdoors. And so if I'm not mistaken, Lamont, like, Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, said, I wasn't talking today. Hey, come, hey, so I'm not trying to talk to uh, Alt. Hey, 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 so, yeah, don't go too far, bro. So you got you got answers that we ain't got. Yeah, yeah. right. right. Don't go too far. Hey, you said right to Gary. We got so the issues. Right. We're gonna scoot down. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. So right here. There you go. If I can get situated, it's gonna look it's gonna look real authentic on the YouTube. That's but, that's so uh, some of, some of us may not realize that um, black folk have like a long history in uh, recreation and sports that we typically don't think uh, black folk do, and so. Um, as I was saying before, we've had some brothers up here who are who are making history. We're on the cusp of Black History Month. Um, if you could talk to us a little bit about, if I have your, your background correct, Black folk, outdoors, skiing, and some of your experiences with that, and maybe some historical context yeah. for that. Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> <laughs> the best introduction I've had um, in a long time. Um, I guess in my mindset, through my experience of being a skier and then snowboarder, and then moving from New York City and New York metropolitan area to Park City, Utah. Um, and as much as we are conditioned unconsciously to recognize that we are seen in this space and not seen in that space, um, it, it burdened me, um, I guess, psychologically and sociologically that uh, <laughs> I didn't see enough brown and black people in the outdoor spaces that I love to recreate in. And so it got to a point after drawing and painting a bunch of moose and white folks skiing down the mountain, which is all beautiful, that I only wanted to create black folks Skiing, you know, Skiing in Color was the name of the, uh, of the series. And that was literally me just alone in my studio create, creating artwork. I didn't know what the reaction would be. I didn't know what the reaction of black folks, white folks, skiers, non-skiers would be. But that really wasn't my concern because um, it was an expression that I was allowed to uh, expose in my town, uh, in a nonprofit in my town. So. You know, one of the things that, you know, we've had the Mike, we've had the Michael Jordan of basketball, we had the Serena and Venus of, of, of tennis, we have the Tiger Woods of golf. And I think because I was in in snow sports and in the mountains and, and loved it so much and felt and, and felt a healthiness in that space, quite naturally I said, well, what, who's the Michael Jordan of skiing? Serena, Serena Williams of skiing. Mm -hmm. And um, why have we not tapped into that? And, but I think even more so, what are the demographics in that space? And why aren't white folks as comfortable as they could be? They'll take a certain amount of us, right? But if I fill the room with canvases of only black faces in ski helmets and goggles, how would you respond to that? Because that's what we live with. That's what we're conditioned to, right? We don't see many, um, maybe a few, but not many at all who look like us in that space. And we just do become accustomed to it and conditioned to it. It's like, okay, this just is what it is. For me, I stopped and said, okay, 
can it be better? You know, and I do want to celebrate those who are there, the Mike Carries, the Danica Carries, the James Mills, and so forth, who are in those spaces, who quite frankly I didn't know yet, right? But um, I want to celebrate those who showed up already. But those who don't see themselves in those spaces, who don't culturally mm. and sometimes economically, there may be a bridge that needs to be gapped. Okay. Um, so, in all that is to say that I do feel like one of the furthest distances and most unlikely um, occurrences in the American experience is that from the slave ship to the ski slope. Mm. Um, why am I there? What did it take for me to get there? How did I get there? You know, uh, prior to my decision making or the desire to want to be there, uh, what happened? Who can I honor? Right? You know, they talk about, you know, my ancestors, uh, what's the phrase? The dream is that I'm in yeah. this place, right? Um, why? Because I wasn't supposed to be there, you know, two, three generations ago. So, I mean, that's basically, you know, what I'm honoring because it's a true part of my life. And to me, it's consequential in um, our advancement to being in any room where we're not expected to be. So, so say that again. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. It's just it's just that one that one, hey, the one, the one part, on Twitter. The slave shit to the ski slopes. Break that down a little bit more. Because that 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 was that might be the name. Full circle Everest from the slave ships to yeah, ski slopes Jesus. to Mount Everest. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit more about, yeah. about that. Yeah. Wow. Um I really want to be clear that I come from a black American perspective. Yeah. You know, um, yes, I have West African ancestry, but I come from slave lineage of, of Virginia and South Carolina. Um, so there's that dynamic that's been ancestrally moved on through my DNA and experience. Uh, so from the survival of diaspora come to the States and through all of it that we know about from 1619 on, right? Jim Crow, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, so on and so forth. What um, environmentally, what um, situationally allowed me to, you know, this zigzagging, uneven, uh, life uh, experience of my ancestors, okay, led me to be able to, to see a lift ticket on the jacket of my white classmate on a Monday morning in high school and say, what is that? I love sports. I shoot hoops in the backyard, you know, so I play a little little league, you know, this, like that. but what is that? That my row house raised father in Baltimore, that my Crown Heights raised mother in Brooklyn, never even conceived of even doing, okay? But I was able to just see that lift ticket on a Monday morning um, on my classmates and say, well, what is that? And why can't I do it? And I didn't do it until I was in my 20s. So I was able to, you know, latch on to a friend of mine and go to uh, Mountain Creek, Mountain Creek, North New Jersey. You know about that? There you go, skiing on ice. <laughs> um, and uh, loving it in a way that um, I hope that would, you know, continuing in that space. So, um, you know, it's, it's almost like as we continually make space, um, take up space in places that we uh, weren't traditionally in as part of this slow, and laboring process, right? And growing into more inclusion and, and belonging, okay? Um, what is this black person in goggles and a helmet on the mountain so distant from where we came from and uniquely put here outside of our will? To me, 
that's what slave shit to Steve Slow means. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a there's a lot that could be talked about. We all have our own experience, but I ended up there, you know. And I was like I told Danica. I said, "Hey, I'm just on the mountains. I'm enjoying myself. I'm chilling. You know what I mean." Mm -hmm. And then I was like, "Yeah, I got a lot of black people out here, but you know, I'm doing what I can do." And then I was like, "Okay, hold up now." After time goes on, what's that about? Yeah. So let me just give you all black faces, which if you tell me it's not about race, if you tell me you don't see color, well, then you just see skiers. Yeah. Okay. So cool, you just see skiers. But, um, you know, and, I, and I'll just give credit to um, the CEO of uh, Ski Utah, where I live, when I think he showed up before my first exhibition of skiing in color went up. So here's a white guy who's been with Ski Utah for 30 plus years. You know, super white environment, super privileged, the whole deal. And he walked into the room, he looked at me, he said, this is powerful. So at least I saw a willingness and an openness and an ally there who said, okay, what can we do together? Mm -hmm. You know, I will help you to help people to see things from any position they're in, you know, whatever race they're in, you know, the other the mountains that I'm affiliated with, I want to be a partner with you to help them at least see people from those spaces. So I'm gonna ask a tough question, okay? To you. <laughs> ready. It's the same situation, but it's football coaches for high school football with 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 black boys, right? Do you think the football coach who's coaching these black boys, or could be basketball coach who's coaching these black boys, comes into that, sees your artwork, and has the same reaction? Or I, maybe I shouldn't, there, there's an assumption embedded in that question because I think the answer is no. So what I'm really asking is, how do, we, how do we get black folk who are in positions who have social capital with young black people to get them to see this artwork and say, hey, we could do something powerful together. I'm trying to, uh, I guess, understand your question. So those who, um, so let me rephrase. Where there's more an expectation of football, basketball. Right, that's in there. Okay, that's, that's what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. um, then when they look at something like skiing, which is, so there's, there's, again, there's this reach, okay? Now we're talking for the basketball courts to the ski slopes. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's closer than a slave ship, though. It's closer. <laughs> it's absolutely closer. It's absolutely closer. Absolutely closer. <laughs> no question. That's it. It's the jump that's the problem. Yeah. Um, so what exactly, what do you ask? So I guess my, my, my real point is, is how do we get black people who are gatekeepers to black youth in a situation where they could see your artwork and be like, man, I want my kids to see this and have access to what you're presenting in your art. Yeah, so my art is one activation. It's what he's doing. It's what he's doing, it's what he's doing. There's an activity, there's, a, there's, a, there's an environment, there's a community activation going on, okay? On different levels through schools, okay? You know, on, when we talk about the Ohio River and stuff, I'm like, what is that? This, this activation is taking places in places that I would never be, okay? So all of these things, okay, that can be, um, it's partake in, okay, that you can see, that you can visualize. I want to help you visualize. Mm. Okay? I want to help you see representation of it, you know. I've painted, uh, you know, for instance, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, and Ski Goggles, and, and gear and stuff like that. Because I, okay, Rosa Parks, because I, I want to be able to say that they were even further away from where we are. Okay, but maybe just a generation, generation or two behind us. Um, 
but um, so I wanted to bring them to the mountains with me. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It was deep, never. Right? It was never mm. a thought. It was never a feeling. It was never a goal. It's a luxury, <laughs> but we deserve those mm. as many yeah. Yeah. as much as anybody else. Yeah. All of the niceties and privileges that, as a full-blooded, okay, again, I'm talking as an American, right? As a full-blooded um, American equal rights, okay, equity, okay, um, you know. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to expand the opportunity through the visualization, right? So by seeing that, okay, I can be that, then that brings me up another notch. So I believe, okay, I can be in whatever space. If I could be skiing, I could be almost anywhere. Yeah you know, in a sense, right? So, and I never thought about it that way because I just kind of like worked my way into it just out of desire, right? Yeah. But in, in, in realizing that that was a gift that was given to me even to think that it was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I want through my work to say, this is an opportunity. If you could just, if I could just flash that image before your eyes, then you know that it exists. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, this is to me. Look, I don't want to monopolize the question. So, y'all, y'all want to ask some questions? Y'all can. Yeah, I, I, I got another answer to that. Totally, go ahead. Because I've been thinking about this. You know, y'all know what ROI is, right? Return right. Investment. Your return on investment. I've been getting away from that, and mm -hmm. I came up with another ROI, which is your recognition of the opportunity to inspire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God. Oh, right. 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 Say it again. Say it again. Right. Say it again. Right. Say it again. Right. Right. Recognition right. for an opportunity to inspire, no. or recognition of an opportunity to include. Ooh. Okay, you can change these up. Okay, but the thing about it is, is that we have to. That's what you did. You recognize that you have an opportunity with your gift to then inspire other people with that gift to, so that they can see them doing something that they never saw before. Because it wasn't, it just wasn't in their, in their mind. Right? They never seen mind. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I think that, you know, we all have an obligation as we sit here being that we have, an, we, we have almost an obligation mm. to recognize the opportunities that we have mm. to inspire using the skills and the experience that we have. When I was, my first years of working in the outdoors, and this is no bullshit, I would constantly think about what would the, what were slaves thinking when they were out trying to free themselves, running from people. And have y'all ever uh, watched, a, I mean, read a book called, I'm not sure, it's How to Shit in the Woods? <laughs> or How to Feed? No, really. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a book, okay? But I think that's one of the first things that we can teach our young people is how to just how to just being comfortable. How to shit in the woods. Just go, just being comfortable yeah. to go shit in the woods. Yeah. Right? Because I'm not. It's 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 like it's Straight like the myself. I don't I don't okay. eat eggs that, that that don't come from the store, right? Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah. I need a bathroom or I can't yeah. go. <clears throat> no. Our the, our ancestors went through that so that you can have the opportunity to do the things that we do. And it's giving ourselves that space. What else is the outdoors but space? But space, mm. yeah. right? Right. So and as we are so stereotypically in these concrete jungles, yeah. you know, as a people, you know, you know, you know, as we're given space, then what do we do and how do we relate and, and how do we create in those spaces and, you know, talk about shit in the woods you know whatever it is you know how do we do that properly you know i talk about how then as an engagement in the browning of america as folks catch on to uh, participating in black and brown folk uh, feeling comfortable participating in that space nature you know god's creation is going to take care of us yeah yeah. What are we gonna do? We're gonna then take care of it, it nature, right? Yeah. You know, so yeah. this bodes well for brands. This bodes bodes well for environments, right? So uh, I think we're talking about something that 
probably in, in I want to say I'm just going to say we're in the beginning of mitigating beginnings of what we need to do mm-hmm. in these conversations. Um, and uh, uh, I think things are changing, but I'm very scared of the the uh, the trend narrative. This is not a trend. They're not. You know what I'm saying? When people say, well, you know, yeah, we'll put your panties up. This is a long haul. I'm like, I know it's a long haul. We get it. This is all part of a long haul. We're used to long hauls. Cool. You know, I'm in for the long haul. You know, this is not a trend. It's not. <laughs> okay. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't want to do anything about it. But I want to do something about it. You know, uh, making a change. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I would just add real quick. I love what you said about like the building on that history is so powerful. Cause I know for us, even when we're hiking with our kids, we always stop at some point and I literally stop them. And I'm like, I want y'all to take this all in and imagine your ancestors were trying to do this 200 years ago. No phone. We wasn't, well, listen, we wasn't playing trap music while we was walking around. I'm just being real. We play music while we hike. Right. Um, That's so cool. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, we ain't have no headlamps, right? Like none of that, right? And like it's powerful because I've seen kids like activate, right? Some of them, and they're like, I could do this. Yeah. Like, I mean, my ancestors did it, and I have a phone, and I can listen to music, and I like I have more tools at my exposure. And so I just want to acknowledge that, like building on that issue, so powerful. And then the second thing I'll say is like just like really affirming your work, brother. How like that activation and art and pictures is so important. So One cool. thing I started doing actually personally, North Carolina connections. My granny, uh, my Aunt Lucy's uh, mother, my granny, she lives uh, on a, still on the farm, on the Bailey Farm, right, in Irwin, North Carolina. And what I started to do was, because she's not on social media, she's 93 years old. She's not on social media. So what I started to do was uh, I would print out pictures of, like, me at different places, and I'd send them to her. So I'd just go to Walgreens, send her pictures. I just sent her, I'm getting ready to send her some from Columbia this winter. And I tell her, and I call her, and we like look through the pictures together. And I'm like, could you imagine that your grandson was hiking in Idaho, mm. right? And taking pictures and selfies. Could you imagine your grandson was hiking in South America, right? And free to do it and not feel scared, right? Because for her, she didn't just have that ability. And for her, it's a, right. it's a huge joy activation mm, to think, yeah. this is a dream of mine. Like my grandson, I have yeah. three grandsons. And like Amazing. one of them is out here hiking, you know, mm-hmm. and of course you're getting all the states Absolutely. mixed up. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> like, he over there up in Canada and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah to her, I'm in the South Africa everywhere, right? But just that activation of visual mediums, just to see like, oh my gosh, like this is what my grandson is doing. And like how powerful that is for our kids to see. And so that's actually something we started doing even more with our kids sometimes. Yeah. I'm like, take pictures as much as you want. And when you get home, I want you to show like your family all these pictures. Because I guarantee some of them may have never dreamed you'd be hiking in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado yeah. with a group of black people, right? You know, it's so powerful. Yeah. So I just want to commend and affirm you that that activation, that artwork, that visual medium is so powerful for those that may not have the access to go there or may not be as able-bodied to go, mm-hmm. right? Think about the elders in our community that can't just get on a flight and go to Idaho and hike. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I could just tap in a little bit to um, our culture. Uh, and, you know, we've seen historically how our creative genius has been accepted and embraced by American culture, our music, our art, you know, our intelligence, all these different things. But so, you know, obviously white consumption of hip hop is far exceeds that of black consumption of hip hop, for instance, you know, we can go back historically and name another other examples. So there'll be some times when white people say, well, I don't know if I should buy that painting of a black person. Like, well, you buy you buy Stevie Wonder, you buy Earth Moon Fire, you buy Whitney Houston. You're not is that you know what I'm saying? You know, are you pigeonhole what black is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You've been buying it, but you're separating what you think was well, not that black. Well, it is black. This is part of the spectrum of who we are. You know what I'm saying? So that is to say that when we do come to the mountains and we bring culture to those places, you know what I'm saying? 
it's not about assimilating to what the mountain thing is, mm. right? Yeah, it's about come as you are. Yep, come as you are. Yeah. And when I hear you on the trails, playing whatever music, do whatever, because I heard yeah. you talk about it earlier today, I was like, my man is doing what on the trails? Yeah, we got I'm like, yeah, because that, because that's, cause that's yeah. true. Um, that's truly authentic to folks having to be reckoning with who you are and saying, okay. We want that in this space as well, as well as the quiet, as well as the, you know what I'm saying? I may, if I play T.I., maybe you're playing Barry Manilow, whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, that's true embracing, you know what I'm saying? You got to take all of me. This is what's true to my culture, just because you don't expect, expect it in this space. It's part of who I am, and I'm in this space. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I want to... Uh, Give a shout out to I know Renee's not here, but to the Greening Youth Foundation. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And two things about it. One is I think the highlight of my career is not any trip I've done, you know, mountain I've climbed or anything like that. It was actually going to the legacy camp out in Atlanta, Georgia, and making a presentation to this group of kids at the Martin Luther King Historic National Historical Park. That was, that's icing on the cake for me. And after that, there was a young girl who came up to me and said, excuse me, sir. And her mother's like, oh, how can I do that? She said, what would you say to a young black girl who wants to climb out of this? And it was just because of this presentation that now in her mind, she sees herself mm. wanting to do this at some point in her life, right? That to me is, you know, that, that's what that is, okay? So last year they did a, uh, two years ago, I forget exactly, but, but you know, they had to move to virtual. But Renee sent me a package for my daughter to, to participate in the virtual camp out. You open it, and in that box was a sweatshirt. And on that sweatshirt was Martin Luther King, picture of Martin Luther King, and it said, I am the dream. Mm-hmm. So what we're talking about is like we are that dream, right? Of what all the people who came before us have fought for, and hey, the dream man, I, that they've seen. He said, "I've been to the mountaintop." Absolutely. Yeah. To me, I remember that, and I actually listened to the speech over again. I was in the middle of creating my collection. I was like, "Wait, he used he's using mountaintop." As a as as a destination, as a goal, as a finishing, as a completion of freedom, Ooh. belonging, togetherness, what we're still fighting for, the mountaintop. Mm-hmm. And here we are in this space. Mm. I was like, wow. And I know James has something to say about that. You know, we've talked about this. Please. Now you will give up my chair. When I went to when I went to when I summoned a Denali in 2013. You see this, the, the summit photo. Uh, at some point, you'll see it. And yeah, that dream. And I'm standing on the side, and I, it, it wasn't something that was planned. But you'll see the picture. I'm not. I'm not going to tell you, but but you'll see it. Okay, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'll sit here. Your space. Yeah, this way. And we're managed to spread the camera out. Yeah. Wow, well, I'm. Really First, not. introduce yourself to the yes, crowd. I'm happy to. Um, my name is James Woodard Mills, and I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer uh, with a specialty in diversity, equity, inclusion, and public land management, and a further uh, specialty in that um, I write about Black Mountaineers. And I have the, the pleasure of writing the book, The Adventure Gap, Changing the Face of the Outdoors, about the uh, 2013 expedition to Nali. And I'm taking notes in hopes of writing a book on full circle Everest. And the culmination of the dream, you know, was started at the March on Washington in 1963. And, and oddly enough, you know, um, the dream wasn't even in the speech originally, you know, and um, uh, Mahalia Jackson from the audience says, tell them about the dream, Martin, tell them about the dream. And then he starts riffing on that concept of, mount, of, of the mountaintop. And he says in the last paragraph, if America's to be a great nation, this must be true. So let freedom ring from every mountainside. 
Mm. Let freedom ring from the hiding Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California, from every molehill and ski hill. Mm. <laughs> Let freedom ring. And, and it's interesting because that's a metaphor. You know, the mountain is um, an illusion of an idea. And in the same issue of Ebony Magazine in 1963, there is a profile on a very obscure climber by the name of Charles Crenshaw. And Charles Crenshaw was a member of the, of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was a hero in World War II. He goes on to um, become an engineer for the Boeing Corporation, quite literally helped to um, design elements of the lunar lander module to put men on the moon. But he was also a member of the Seattle Mountaineers. And he was among the very first people to be invited on the 37th expedition to the summit of Denali, the highest peak in North America, then known as Mount McKinley. And the remarkable thing about that expedition is that um, um, they made it to the summit of Denali seven days after the signing of the Civil Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he quite literally personifies King's Mountain Dream. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and as he's standing there on the summit, he, is telling the story of why this is so important. And he says, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but the, the line goes something, something to the, the effect of the climbers. Um, were, it was so easy for the climbers that day that as they stood on the summit, they aspired to something yet higher. So something higher than the mountaintop. You know? And back then, and even today, the, the highest mount, higher mountains are places like Everest. And, Charlie Crenshaw comes back to Seattle, tells his story to the guys at Boeing, but nobody else. You know, and his story literally goes untold until I asked the question in 2013, 2012. So who's the first black American to summit Denali? And the first response that I got from the national climate community was quote, who cares? <laughs> You know, so in an industry that measures everything else, okay, first, first Spaniard, first Norwegian, first blind person, first, blind person, first left handed person, okay, all those things, but nobody cares who the first black person is summoned, Denali. And at the time, there had uh, been a black person that had summoned Everest in 2006, Sophia Dannenberg, you know, who many of us know. You know, did made this a remarkable achievement, but it went unreported. You know, so that in 2006 when it happened, it wasn't in the in the climbing press, it wasn't in the national press. It was literally reported in exactly one place, the Chicago Reader. You know, which is basically a weekly publication that you get with your groceries at the supermarket. That was it. And so when we look at an event like the full service. 2006. This is 2006. 2006. Okay. And so, and, and to that, there's yet to be an, uh, an African American man to make it to the summit of Everest. You know, there have been black men, you know, black men from Africa, black men from Kenya. You know, there are other places, other climbers that have done this, but not an African American man. Now, that's different. Okay. Because now we're talking about someone who is the, the product of the diaspora a product of the right. civil rights movement, a, pri a, a product of the public school system in, nor in North America. That's a different type of person. And frankly, that is someone who needs to be acknowledged. And this expedition, I think, is remarkable because you know, we're talking about putting an entire team of African-American men and women on the summit at one time. And that, to me, is exceptional. And by extension, it is indeed phenomenal. So, and how's that for a dream? So James, I got, I got a question. What does it take for us to not so much wait for inclusion and equity, but for like black communities more broadly to embrace the fact that like you know, there's a whole team climbing Mount Everest? You know what you know what I mean? Like what, what type of things need to need to occur from a media person's perspective? to get the word out to the people in the communities that we represent mm -hmm. 
to understand the significance of what's happening or just right. to understand that it's happening. Well, for starters, we have the conversation like we're doing right now. Because I, I just posted a picture on Instagram called One Night in Denver. Okay, so here we are. And, and I've been attending the Outdoor Retailer Show since I was 25 years old. But for, I attended my first show in 1990, 1992. So in August, I will have been doing this for 30 years. I have never seen an event like this. Never. Because there haven't there really hasn't been enough of us. <laughs> you know, um, there's me, there's Michael Carey, you know, um, and Phil, you know, but you know, we would wave it to each other in the in the aisles and go to the next event that we we're all going to. But there's never this big conversation. There's never this this outpouring of of intention and inclusion and being able to have these kinds of conversations. And there weren't magazine articles, there weren't films, there weren't paintings. I mean, that's the main reason why I reached out to Lamont to paint um, Charles Crenshaw's portrait so that it now hangs in the American Alpine Club Museum. Okay, we can see the, that image now because we take the time to tell the stories. I've written a book, we've produced a film, you know, we continue to write magazine articles. And the great thing about it is it's not just me anymore. There's a half dozen to a dozen really talented black writers that are telling their stories about the natural environments that they're pioneering in, whether they're climbing mountains, whether they're climbing ice, whether they're skiing. You know, next week I'm um, going with um, the first black woman to hike the Ice Age Trail. Mm the distance of 100, um, 1,200 miles in winter in Wisconsin. Wow. There wasn't a single day last wow. year where she was on the trail that was above zero. Mm. Okay, and so now her career started. She's you know under 30 years old. She just started out. This will be her first full year as a professional adventurer. And she's got, she's got a tent, she's got her gear. Um, we're actually gonna do a five day training trip to uh, northern Minnesota, where it's expected, again, not to be a day over, over zero, but she's going to teach me a couple of things, you know, because she just literally took it on herself to, to borrow a, a dog and some equipment and do this amazing adventure. And she's, she has aspirations to one day ski across Greenland. I think that, that she could very easily um, be on an expedition to go to the North Pole. Okay. And it's, Ultimately, though, because of the narratives that we tell, the stories that we share, the conversations that we have that ultimately make it so that we can have these experiences that we can share and pass on to other people. Now, I want to bring this into perspective for y'all. And it's, it's not about me, but it's about how this full circle movement is it's bigger than me. I don't know why I came up with the name years ago, right? But this is the deal, okay. I was born in 1963, right? The same year that, we're, that we were just talking about, okay? Which was the same year of the first American expedition to Everest. In 2012, I was a part of the North Face uh, uh, National Geographic expedition that commemorated that expedition, okay? As a black person on that team. Um, Just before I came here, actually, no, just before I went, I was on my way to to, uh, uh, to Nepal. I just came back from Nepal just yesterday. <laughs> on my way to Nepal, I was just looking for something to read. I'm like, I just need something. So I went to the magazine rack and I just looked and I like fly fishing. So I'm like, oh, okay, fly fishing. Maybe. So I just picked it up, right? Out of all the magazines in, in the airport, I went to this rack and picked up this magazine. And it said something about, um, I forget what the, what the title was, but I kept reading the book. And I opened this book up and it's about a Bohemian man, black dude, who's one of the, a well-known fly fishing guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is no bullshit. He guided Martin Luther King down this river Martin Luther King didn't fish, but he just took him down this river. And during that trip, he wrote that speech. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Oh, yes. No, no, I'm telling you, you can't, you can't make this up. No, right. no yes. I have, I mean, I, I have the magazine in my room right now. I'll show it to you tomorrow. Right. So for, to, to, to be leading this expedition, to be putting this expedition together, to have been on the expedition that commemorated the first American expedition, to have been born in the year of the first American expedition, and then to pick up that magazine and to realize that we talk about black people don't even fly fish, right? Now here's a man who, you know, from the Bahamas, who's one of the best known fly fishing guides oh. in that area who guided Martin Luther King a week before he died, or two weeks before he died when he wrote that speech. And I just happened to grab it off of off the magazine. I'm sorry, I gotta go to the bathroom, but <laughs> <laughs> that just brings it all full circle, brings it all full circle. Yeah. You know? and, and actually, it, um, and to that point, the uh, the Bill Popover one too, Bill. And to that point, you know, just to pick up on Phil's story too, the National Museum of Civil Rights in Memphis, at the location of the Lorraine Hotel, yes. invited uh, Full Circle Everest to take a copy of King's Dream Speech mm. to the summit of Everest. Wow. wow. Okay, and um, I'm helping them to put together an exhibit on Full Circle Expedition for the museum that will include a, a, the, the Charlie Crenshaw portrait. It will tell the story of King's pseudo relationship with that climber in Ebony Magazine. And we actually have an original copy of that 1964 co um, a copy of Ebony Magazine. And also being able hopefully to commission a new painting of this expedition team. You know, so again, this is ultimately how we tell these stories by, you know, creating the environments, by creating the platforms where we can share these narratives in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And it does come full circle. Absolutely. If I could just add one more thing. Um, I was talking to Dr. Uh, Jerome Davis earlier with focusing on inclusion of the spaces and that the condition that we are all born into, right? and the in, intentional behaviors that happened for decades and centuries prior to us um, having the gift of, of, of having life. Um, what we're doing now, I feel like we have to look as our turn to have intentional behaviors. There were, there's not many years post-civil rights, all right, there are 300 some odd years pre-civil rights, okay? We're in the beginnings of um, our responsibility to be intentional, you know, whatever our role is we play, you know? Don't look at it as small. And it's like, I know what I do, I'm just one guy, you know? Danica is such a leader. Mike, man, I love you, buddy. It's you awesome. Know? I mean, it's, it's um, I, I, I never want us to feel too small. Stay in your lane, don't compete, collaborate, be unified. All of us is playing a specific role, you know, very particular, such a time as this, for you to do what you're doing. So, because all that stuff that was done before us, okay, that's what we're battling against, was the repetition of activations that each of us has a role to do, right? It may feel small, but let's keep repeating it. Let's keep sharing it. And uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. yeah, and I would just add, just to kind of wind down, I would say too, like my encouragement to everyone in here is also like continue to tell those stories, you know? Absolutely. I mean, I'll just share real quick our story with Mike, right? <laughs> from Tanks, how we told him, remember oh, we yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I told the story last night at dinner, but uh, Lex and I met Friday uh, at uh, one of the only black owned uh, pizza joints in San Antonio. And as we're leaving, uh, Mike, the owner walks up, he's like, hey, what was y'all brothers meeting about? And I was like, oh, we're getting ready to interview uh, the leader of the first all black team to go to Everest. And he was like, 
what? <laughs> He's like, going to Everest. Right? And I was like, yeah, his brother's like assembling the whole team. They're going to Everest. He joked, he's like, man, tell him to talk to God for me because I ain't going up there, right? <laughs> and like, I ain't going up there. He's like, that's high up. What did he say? He's like, he's like, they even got helicopters that go up there. I don't know, right? But the fact that we told that story, right, for him to see that. And another thing, I didn't even share this, but it was funny. My, my brother texted me uh, like two weeks ago, the, one of the articles that came out about Full Circle. And he's like, did you hear about this? You know, I did the casual brag. I'm like, yeah, we're getting ready to interview him. Right? <laughs> you know, the leader. And so I just encourage y'all to keep telling those stories because, you know, even if it doesn't get to the written word for some folks, just telling those at places like this, at restaurants, and just sharing those stories has a huge, huge ripple effect. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. so I'm going I'm to jump in because I know, Danica, you gave me the wrap-up time, <laughs> yeah. right? And I, I know y'all, I, I know y'all want to hear more about, like, the Full Circle Everest trip. Um, you can follow my YouTube channel, Entrepreneurial Appetite, on YouTube. You can follow me on social media, Entrepreneurial Appetite. If you Google it, you'll find it. We have a podcast. You can find all the information there. And we'll, I, I'll have, make sure I have all these brothers' information where you can find out where they are, how you can support what they're doing. But Phil, I want to give you the last word before we end for the evening. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, my last word is, you know, earlier someone asked me, like, what can people do? And you'll notice, I didn't really talk about money. It's not about giving money. It's about spreading the word. Because that, and, and Eddie is here, and he can attest to this, is what we wanted. Again, I was a part of an expedition in 2012 where nobody knew that, just like nobody knew about Sophia. Nobody knew about the, well, up until six months ago, we thought that there were only six Black people who had summited Mount Everest. Now we know of 11, right? Just by people being aware that this expedition is happening, they said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those folks. I did it in this year, blah, blah, blah. And so really, it's just about spreading the awareness that we are here and we do these things. And you can do those things too. Anyone, right? And that's what was lacking. That's what has been lacking until now. But you remember I said that there are a lot of people doing a lot of things from the black and brown community, right? But Everest is an icon, right? That, that brings, people ask me during interviews and so on, like, why Everest? And I have to turn this and switch it back to them and ask them the question, would we be sitting here having this conversation mm -hmm. if we weren't talking about Mount Everest? No, we wouldn't be, right? So that's what Everest, that's what this expedition is doing, is bringing people and making them aware of something and having a conversation because it wouldn't happen otherwise. Mm -hmm. We're all a part of, uh, of something bigger than us. We all play a role, a small role, and the things we do are big, but it's greater than, than us. And the mind said, it's just keep doing those little things that you do, and we may not ever see it. Right? I'm used to that. When I worked in those courses, you spend a month with people, you know, from day one to day 30, and then they go away, you never see them again in life, right? So we may not ever see what's coming after this. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I never thought I would see this 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. okay? But now here we are sitting here all together talking about something, again, that's greater than us. So just spreading the word about what we're all doing is enough, you know, to get, to just keep that, that movement moving. So I appreciate the, um, you know, Danica and working with y'all to put this together. Um, I didn't know what it was going to be like. Uh, I'm tired, <laughs> you know, but again, it's that recognition of an opportunity to inspire. I could have went home. I didn't have to, I could have just went home and like, you know what? I don't have the energy to be here, you know? Thank but you. Yeah, great I'm going to put that energy because I recognize that um, there aren't enough of us to keep talking and telling these stories. And so I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I've been holding it, baby. Man, All right. God. Thank <laughs> you.